Welcome back. I'm going to start sketching an analytical framework to help you engage with the factual material that you will need to master about the legal arrangements that govern the EU's lawmaking powers. You'll find more detail about this framework in the Craig and de Burka textbook or in Chalmers et al and to some extent in the Barnard and Piers book. And these books are available to you electronically via um, the library. Uh, in particular, Craig and de Burka and Barnard and Piers are available on Law Trove. So the first part of this analytical framework that I want to talk about is the level of comparison and the temporal frame. The European Union is not a state, but it has lawmaking powers in the way that states do. What legitimates state power to make laws? Well, a starting point is the concept of representative democracy. A state's legislature makes law on behalf of their populations. The legislature is made up of representatives of those populations elected by those populations. That is what legitimates the legislature's lawmaking power. Now, I'd like you to have a look at Article 10 on the Treaty of European Union. So turn to the Treaty of European Union and find Article 10. So Article 10 provides that the functioning of the Union shall be founded on representative democracy. And it goes on to say that citizens are directly represented at Union level in the European Parliament, that member states are represented in the European Council by their heads of state or government, and in the Council by their governments, themselves democratically accountable either to their national parliaments or to their citizens. Article 10.3 then goes on to say that every citizen has the right to participate in the democratic life of the Union and that decisions shall be taken as open and as closely as possible, as openly and as closely as possible to the citizen. And the final provision of Article 10 TU talks about political parties at European Union level. So Article 10 talks about a number of European Union institutions and here are here is a, a slide with pictures of the main European institutions and where each of them is based. Um, so you'll see that some of them are based in Brussels but others are based in other cities. Article 10 TU specifies that the European Parliament is directly elected by the, the electorate in the member states. The Council consists of member states' ministers and the European Council, which isn't the same as the Council, consists of heads of state and government. Heads of state and ministers of government in power are accountable to the voters or the parliament via the parliament of each individual member state. Before we go any further, just pause this lecture and think and jot down a few ways that you can think of ways in which that statement, the statement that the elected organs of a state make law on behalf of their populations, the elected organs of a state make law on behalf of their populations. Jot down ways in which that statement is too simplistic an account of representative democracy in real life. You can base your jottings on any state or states that you know something about. What did you write? I guess you noted at least some of the following things and maybe some other things that I haven't thought of. It's too simplistic a statement because it doesn't account for who gets the vote. And nowadays we definitely think that all women should have the vote, but what about young people? What about non-citizens? Should they have the vote? 
you perhaps jotted some, down something about geographical complexi complexity. What if different parts of the country have different needs or preferences? So a federal system like in Germany, for instance, is a much more complex form of representative democracy than the simplistic account that we talked about in the previous slide. Then maybe you wrote something about checks and balances. What about the checks and balances on the power of an elected legislature? So what if, for instance, an elected legislature wanted to deprive people of their lives or their liberty without due process? Many democracies have um, a protection for human rights that stops elected legislatures from doing that, that kind of thing. And many democracies have a bicameral legislature with two chambers or two entities that are involved in lawmaking so that there's a check on each of the chambers. Then perhaps you thought about other branches of government. What about the courts, the judiciary? What about the executive, ministries? And then perhaps you thought about delegated lawmaking. A lot of the technical law that governs our lives is not made by the legislature per se. The power to make it is delegated to the government or to local government. Um, the Public Health Control of Diseases Act 1984 is a case in point. It gives significant power to the government to adopt regulations like the coronavirus regulations of 2020, which constrain freedoms like the closing of premises or prohibiting gatherings and so on that we're experiencing at the moment. Or what about other interests? Representative democracies are subject to all sorts of other interests on the laws that are made through lobbying of par parliamentarians, through social media manipulation of voter behaviour, through spreading of false information or fake news and so on and so forth. So even when we're going to compare the European Union to a state, and of course the U European Union is not a state, even if we're going to compare the European Union to a state, when we're thinking analytically about how democratic or how legitimate the European Union is, we need to be careful not to compare the European Union to a simplistic or idealised notion of democracy that isn't found in any real-life state. And, of course, as I've said twice now already, the European Union is not a state. So what if we compare the European Union, instead of to states, to other international organisations? Let's say the World Trade Organisation. Even if the European Union didn't exist, products and services would move across borders, creating a need for states to make legal arrangements to respond to their interdependencies. No state in the contemporary world can escape those interdependencies, and no democratic system can avoid them by a mere assertion of sovereignty. Let's see how Steve Wetherill puts this. Um, I want to, to read to you, and this is, again, I'm, I'm wanting to, to model here how you might do your own reading. Let me read to you from the beginning of Steve Wetherill's book, Law and Values in the European Union, because he has a really good way of explaining this point about interdependencies. A state decides to build a new power plant. It locates it on its coast, far away from any of its cities, where the prevailing winds will blow polluting fumes and other toxic materials away from its territory and towards the densely populated territory of a neighbouring second state. That second state is home to a small and not very successful producer of cars, which lobbies the government to introduce new product specifications, which have the effect of excluding from the market cars of a different design imported from a third state, which is home to several large producers of cars previously popular among, but now unavailable to, consumers of the second state. The third state introduces repressive measures against a minority group, and many members of that group flee its territory, forcing a neighbouring fourth state to set up large refugee camps to accommodate them. The fourth state has lately cut its tax rates applicable to companies, and has also abolished many rules setting health and safety standards for the workplace, as well as repealing laws setting a minimum wage. A neighbouring fifth state finds that several firms based on its territory have chosen to move their headquarters to the fourth state, where their operating costs are consequently much lower. The fifth state has introduced strict new laws designed to ensure secrecy in the banking sector. A neighbouring sixth state 
fears that this has made it much easier for criminals operating on its territory to conceal the pathways through which they transmit their ill-gotten gains, thereby making the detection of crime much harder. That sixth state has a fixed exchange rate for its currency, which the government decides is far too high, and so it decides to devalue the currency. In consequence, its exports become much cheaper, and traders in a seventh state find that they are rapidly losing market share to goods produced in and exported from the sixth state. And so on. One may readily add extra states and imagine further flashpoints and disputes. Each of these cases has its own nuance, but the core common problem is that each state fears that a neighbouring state's policies are causing it harm, while it stands accused of inflicting harm on a neighbour. In each case, the state is exercising its sovereignty to locate the power plant, to set product specifications, to repress minorities, to tax companies, and so on. And in each case, the state is a victim of the sovereignty exercised by one of its neighbours. It suffers pollution, it finds export markets are closed, it must deal with an influx of refugees, it suffers co corporate flight, and so on. This is the reality of state sovereignty when states are interdependent. It, its exercise creates victims. All the states are victims. There is, accordingly, a case for cooperation. And that case for cooperation is the logic of the European Union. So notice how Steve places law centrally in his account of the logic and purposes of the European Union. The treaty texts, agreements between states in international law, manage the necessary interdependence between the EU's member states. And the World Trade Organization does the same. But its treaties, the World or Trade Organization's treaties, involve significantly less attention to democratic principles and certainly nothing like Article 10 TEU. International trade agreements are agreed and run by executives, by governments. They do not have parliaments. They are subject to almost no oversight from national parliaments. In this frame, the European Union has significantly more democratic credentials, and the law secures those. Furthermore, and finally, thinking um, about how we might analyse the EU in terms of, of how democratic it is, those who see the European Union as an emerging democracy accept that the European Union has not reached that stage yet. But they believe that it is possible or desirable that it will do so in the future. In that future, goes the argument, there would be a pan-European electorate voting for pan-European political parties representing different policies supported by a pan-European media. The European Union would, in this imagined future, have powers over the things that matter the most to the electorate. Powers to tax and spend, powers of redistribution of resources, powers to secure health care and welfare. Without this level of centralisation, the European Union will never attract sufficient voter turnout to count as a truly democratic system. And this is something that Klaus Offer touches on in his quotation, the question on which we, uh, from which we started with. So here we need to take a temporal frame and we need to track the ways that the European Union has become more like a representative democracy as seen in the form of a state over time. Now you will want to be making some notes here about the key factual points. Moments in the European Union's history when, for example, the European Parliament was first directly elected when the European Parliament became a co-legislator with the Council in the ordinary legislative procedure, and so on. Make sure that you can cite the relevant legal sources as you make those notes.